special guest today, Dr. Ravi Tamargo, clinical psychologist and COVID long hauler from Florida. She will be talking to us today about COVID-19 mental health and long COVID multi-system organ damage. We are so happy you're able to make it with us today. I'll turn it Thank you. Thank you. So the title of today's presentation is COVID-19 Mental Health and Long COVID Multi-Organ Damage, Multi-Organ, Multi-System Organ Damage. And because I'm a COVID long hauler, I'll ask everyone for a little uh, forgiveness if I were, uh, make glitches because my, uh, my brain doesn't always process things in the way that I would like it to. So since uh, pictures um, speaks a thousand words. I thought I'd put a few pictures here to show my journey from health to my current state of a long COVID disability. So up in the top corner, you see me kayaking on the Pacific Ocean. And that was before I got COVID. I was extremely fit. I worked out every day at Orange Theory Fitness. And um, I did a lot of different physical activities. I was all American in two sports and at the university that I attended and um, I've been very fit my entire adult life. Um, the picture below that one is um, in January of 2021 when I was being taken from physical therapy to the hospital via ambulance in a snowstorm in New York City. The picture next is this January of 2022 when I was in the hospital on a BiPAP and I'll tell more about that in a little bit. And the last picture is me um, last week um, in my physical therapy on Friday. Um, so March, 2022. So this is a crazy list and I'm not going to read this. So you're safe, but I wanted to put up here the, um, what I call the low lights of my first 90 days. So keep in mind that I'm at 697 day, 94, 694 days of suffering with long COVID. I have never gotten well. So I am one of those patients that falls into the category of never recovering. So I just continued to go downhill and have continued to, to do that with episodes of doing really quite well. So I became ill on May 7th, 2020. And this is from my journal. I just dropped it in here because I've kept a journal of all of my symptoms and, um, and I just tried to fit it onto the slide. And so the first day I woke up, I was two and a half hours late for work. And um, that was a sign because I, um, <laughs> um, I don't, that doesn't happen to me. And I had hoarseness. Um, I, I, I sounded like a, a man and I had a sore throat, a dry cough, uh, pressure in my upper chest, a severe headache, fatigue, shortness of breath. And I smelled wood burning and it felt like everywhere I went was on fire and I hadn't had no appetite since that day. And, um, I have many of those symptoms still today. I have a hoarse voice, but it's getting better. I don't sound like a man anymore. People uh, tell me they recognize my voice. I have a sore throat. I sometimes cough. I sometimes have chest pressure. I sometimes have a headache. I have still profound fatigue. And fatigue is not even the right descriptor for what long, long haulers are feeling. It is a profound exhaustion that is unparalleled in any level of the definition of fatigue. Um, I have shortness of breath on exertion and I still have phantom smells. Um, I, I have all kinds of interesting smells and I will say, oh, do you smell that? And everyone around me says, no, they don't smell it. And I will also experience um, a disorder of my taste. So um, the other sort of um, significant uh, event happened on my first day 
was um, about three o'clock in the afternoon, I um, had sudden onset numbness of the lower half, le left lower half of my face and the, my left thigh. Um, so I contacted my treatment team and they told me to go to the emergency room. I had a CT and I had a thrombosis in my right middle cerebral artery. So that's a blood clot in layman's terms. I was hospitalized on the neurology um, floor and was treated with low dose heparin. And I um, ultimately they were able to bust the clot. And um, so I ended up being diagnosed with a TIA rather than having a full stroke. And this was the beginning of the profound insomnia and malignant wakefulness that I have experienced for 674 nights. So um, I, I'm not gonna go through all the symptoms here, but I just wanted to show the progression of symptoms that I've experienced over the course of the first 90 days. And I'll point out a couple major things. Um, very typical symptoms that long haulers are experiencing. I experienced um, those. And then on June 2nd, which was not even an entire month from when I got sick, I um, started having um, stabbing in a single vessel in the top of my right foot. And it lasted for seven hours. And at one point I had 28 stabs in one hour. I was making little tick marks. And then once that stopped, I was, it was followed by searing, burning pain that lasted for four hours. And my, my feet and all of my toes became purple. And this was ultimately diagnosed as COVID toes and COVID feet. I also developed a, a, a rash on my left thigh. Then the next event was June 12th when I had sudden onset shortness of breath, a severe stabbing pain in the posterior right rib cage. Um, and I really was struggling to breathe. So my family took me to the emergency room where I was separated from them and they were left out in the parking lot and um, I was diagnosed with um, pleuritic pain. Um, later, I learned that I, from the coughing I was doing, I fractured my right lateral rib. Then um, I, my first episode of tachycardia and palpitations was in um, June 29th. And that's when I first noticed the hair loss. And then um, I, the next major event was on August 4th when I experienced sudden onset atrial fibrillation. My heart rate was um, continual at 186. My heart felt like it was pounding out of my chest. I of course went to the emergency room and I was admitted and held in the emergency room in COVID precaution um, where they kept me for 10 hours until they were able to chemically convert me back to a normal rhythm. And then I was admitted to the COVID floor. And um, then the next slide is my next 23 months, um, which is a typo, which I just now see because it was the next 20 months. And this is where I um, continue to have daily fevers and tachycardia. Um, for, um, for many months, the high was 202 of my heart rate. Um, I, as an athlete, I don't train at 202. In fact, I had never seen 202 until I um, experienced this um, cardiac issue with COVID. I also have had the ongoing um, um, exhaustion and um, I began experiencing lucid dreaming and um, multiple, multiple symptoms, symptoms that, that came, out, came over, over time. In October, I was admitted to the hospital again, diagnosed with adult failure to thrive because I had lost 10 pounds in one week. My body wouldn't absorb the, the uh, sufficient nutrients, nothing. It wouldn't absorb my, my food 
or the supplements that I was taking. Ultimately, I lost 28 pounds. That was just the the second phase of of weight loss because I had lost um, 10 pounds in the first two weeks of of being ill. Because um, I I spent a week at the hospital here in Florida and they just really didn't know what to do with me. Um, They really hadn't seen a COVID long hauler. They didn't know what that was and nor did many people. Um, certainly um, one person knew what it was, and, and, and that was Amy Watson, who coined the phrase COVID long haulers, because she, she's been sick longer than me. And she created the, a Facebook group, um, COVID, um, Long Haul COVID Fighters, to try to have a community to help each other. So because I wasn't getting better, and no one there really knew what to do with me, my husband and I decided to Uh, make the trip to New York City. And we went to the center for um, Mount Sinai's center for post COVID care. And I began treatment on on the 28th of August of of, um, 2020. I spent 11 months there. And um, pretty much every organ in my body was being seen by a specialist. So somebody can do the math there. Um, It was really quite um, intense in terms of the number of um, providers that I was seeing and the number of tests that I underwent. And what I ultimately learned was um, many of the tests were simply data collection because the doctors there were so wonderful in saying, yes, you are a COVID long hauler and we are so sorry we don't really know what to do for you, but we're gonna try to treat the symptoms as they present and treat you individually and not just throw you into your COVID long hauler basket and give you all the same treatments as everyone else. So they tailored my treatments to the symptoms that I was experiencing, which I thought was really helpful. Another thing that came out of that program was that I was able to participate in dozens of clinical trials. And I think that um, made me feel useful since I wasn't able to see my patients. I wanted to participate in the gathering of clinical information to help other people and hopefully help myself. And that gave me um, a sense of purpose. The, um, while I was there, I was hospitalized many times and um, Two of the times that were significant that I want to make sure people know about is after I had the vaccines, each of the two vaccines. So I was first vaccinated in February and then again in March. And I spent five days in the hospital each time because all of my original symptoms that had begun to improve were back with a vengeance. And in fact, they were more intense than when I was originally ill. Ultimately, the team there decided that I was not to have the booster when it became available because I was responding with an immune response that was extremely um, robust. And so I have not been able to get um, the, the, third, the booster. And um, this came... I was in a situation where I was wearing a cardiac monitor after the first episode, um, after the vaccine. And then I got the next um, vaccine and I was wearing the monitor and I was on the street in New York City, having just come out of the doctor's office and my monitor, um, I I couldn't breathe. I had to squat down on the the, um, ground in New York City and everyone knows that's a lovely experience. And... um, I was just outside of the hospital, but basically I was invisible and um, that my phone rang and I thought I should answer it. Um, I was actually hoping it was my husband who was meeting me for this appointment that I was out just outside across the street at the Starbucks that I never made it to. And um, my heart monitor company was calling to see if I was okay. They um, asked me where I was, was I alone? And I said, I'm just outside of the hospital, but I am alone. My husband hasn't arrived yet. And, and they told me I needed to go to the emergency room, which was really just catty cornered down the street. 
So um, that was an, uh, another of the many hospitalizations that I experienced there. I also want to let you know that I started getting well in um, um, in May, and um, I was participating in a treatment trial. I was responding to the treatment. I felt like I was about 75% improved. And then I was stricken with what I refer to as um, Delta New York City. And um, I, I was not hospitalized with that, um, but I, um, Oh, actually, that one I was hospitalized for. I, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. I was hospitalized for that. And um, I had you know, significant issues um, after the, that second um, infection. Um, I also want to, to let you know that I um, also started, continued on the treatment protocol that I was on in the, the clinical trial that I was in. And they worked with the hospital and the hospital allowed me to continue with the clinical trial, even though it was outside of them. And they provided me the medications there. Then um, I started doing better. I got to about 90 percent better. So I came home to Florida to be with my mom because, as I mentioned, I hadn't been home in 11 months. So um, while I was um, um, at the airport, getting on my flight, my I get a text message from my office manager who told me that earlier in the day, my mother had been um, found non-responsive and taken um, by ambulance to the hospital and she had been diagnosed with COVID-19 and I'm en route to come home. So that was you know, concerning. When I got home, they said they were keeping her in the hospital. So that gave me a little bit of a sigh of relief because at this point I already knew that I was immunocompromised from COVID and I was very nervous about getting COVID. It was very raging in Florida, but I thought I was gonna be quite safe because I was coming to my home and not going anywhere. And my mom didn't go anywhere except medical appointments, which is in fact where we were able to trace her her reinfection. This was her second infection. It's now my third infection, which we refer to as Delta in Florida from my mother. Um, I was not hospitalized. I, that very day, I was given monoclonal antibodies. And um, then I plateaued. I got a little bit better. And then I just stayed at that point um, for a long time. And literally until um, December um, on Christmas day, I had severe muscle pain. And um, the next morning when I, and I'm talking severe, screaming on Christmas day in agony. And if I moved any part of my body, I was in sheer agony. And now I have a, my, my family is here. My children are home, my husband and um, my daughter's boyfriend and his mother. And, um, and I'm, I, this is one of those nightmares on, on Christmas day when, when there's massive drama and you happen to be the drama. So the next day I woke up um, unable to walk upright and over the course of that week, it continued to get worse and worse. I was unable to open uh, a bottle of water or my water bottle um, or um, a pop top. Um, I couldn't do any of those things. And um, I contacted my neurologist and he was in Utah. I contacted my primary care and he was in California. And um, so I decided, oh, I'll, I'll just wait. I'm not going to the emergency room. And if you talk to many long haulers, they will tell you they have to be in severe circumstances to go to the emergency room again. And honestly, I can't tell you how many times I've been to the emergency room or how many times I've been admitted. Um, I just don't even want to know what that number is. So I, I saw my, my primary care 
um, immediately upon return to the office the first week of January. And as soon as he saw me, he said, oh my goodness, you need to go to the hospital. And he called my neurologist and coordinated my admission to the neurology board under my neurologist. And the next day at the hospital, I was completely unable to walk. And things progressed and I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And it is one of the neurological symptoms that um, is now known to be associated with, with long COVID. Um, then, because you know that can't be enough to end up being in, unable to walk, I developed a, um, um, a disease of my, um, my white blood cells where I was unable to make white blood cells in, or in red blood cells, in fact, and um, was put on neutropenic precautions. And I was kept in the hospital um, until they gave me the treatment that they give. Um, patients that are, have cancer that are un undergoing chemotherapy in order to get my bone marrow to create white blood count. I was profoundly, critically low was the clinical de description. And I um, just uh, last week got back up into the low but acceptable range and um, now don't have to be on neutropenic precautions. So everybody in my house doesn't have to wear a mask now and I can actually go outside. I wasn't permitted to go outside except to go to a necessary medical appointment while I was in that very low state. So that is um, my history. Um, February was followed by March and I developed the dreaded um, tinnitus. Many, many long haulers are getting this. And I remembered thinking way, way back when, um, in fact, one of our members of Survivor Corps and long haul COVID fighters um, committed suicide because she was suffering with profound tinnitus. And there's no getting away from it. It's there all the time. But I have found for me that having music or um, TV in the background helps me to not hear it so badly. So that's my experience. I wanted to, um, I forgot to put a picture of my heap of medications. So I, I wanted um, to, to tell you that I had been prescribed 77 different medications over these 23 months. And I'm currently taking 21 pharmaceuticals and seven nutraceuticals and um, I've got a couple other medications that are on hold um, because there's a, a cross with some other medications. So the pharmacist won't, won't release them until she talks to my doctor. So that is um, my experience as a COVID long hauler in a, a large nutshell. Um, next, I would like to show you this slide. And this is a wonderful slide done by uh, Sandra Lopez Leon and her team. And this article that was published in Nature, um, it is 80% of um, folks who had long COVID had at least um, one symptom, 80%. But then you start looking at the percentages of of the other. And the next is the fatigue um, that I told you about. And then we have headache and then all of these others, as you see, and I know this, you can't read the, the small print, but it, it's all in the, the big bubbles, but it just shows you in, in, in two formats, how to read that, that data. Um, I also wanted to let you know that of the 55 long COVID symptoms that are listed here, and there are more than 55 symptoms, um, I've experienced all but 11 of these symptoms to date, plus many other. And I, I want you to, to be aware of that because this has not been sorted yet. There are many more symptoms um, about which we need to become. And then look at that tinnitus right there, in the, right above her head, 15%. And um, it's, it's really quite, quite brutal. Okay, 
Next, I'd like to talk about the neurological consequences of COVID-19. There, as you can see, are many neurological manifestations of, of long COVID. And um, I think um, I want to point out that there are, it's not known yet what the underlying mechanisms are, but there are several theories and they are here on the slide in terms of neuroinflammation, um, the initial cytokine storm, but for long haulers, it's an ongoing um, um, uh, hur hurricane force or maybe um, a, a lower storm um, force um, inflammation process. Um, everybody that you see, whether it's about your ears or your nose or your eyes or another organ, when they look at it, it's inflamed. So we know that there's inflammation going on and there's clearly um, neuro, um, neuroinflammation. The brain, many of us talk about our brain is on fire, that we have this pressure in our head that it feels like our brain is going to explode beca because it doesn't fit in our skull, which also leaves you with a headache that is unknown um, to mankind. It's just an unbelievable head headache. Um, there's, there are other beliefs about um, the ACE2 um, consequences and hypoxia. I definitely was hypoxic. One of the things I, I um, will talk about a little bit later, um, but I'll just mention, um, I wasn't diagnosed as hypoxic until September of 2020. And remember I got sick in um, May of 2020. I know there were times in the middle of the night when I was sitting alone in isolation in my bedroom that I should have gone to the hospital, but I was too sick to even get someone in my home to alert them that I needed to go to the hospital. And I absolutely was one of those persons who wrote their love letter to their friends and family so that if I died, in the night and they found me that they would know what had happened. So I think it's really important that hypoxia be addressed because um, all of us know if you're not getting oxygen to your brain, there's going to be damage and understanding that the trauma that it is causing on, for people. The other issue, as I mentioned for me, is the thrombotic complications. As you know, with people that are in the hospital, a lot of people are dying from strokes. But for those of us that are long haulers, we may not have a full stroke. And so it's, we need to be aware of that, that there are other, other things that are um, coagulation disorders um, that are happening that are damaging our, our brains. So over um, on the, the far right of the slide, there is um, a, a listing of many neuro, neurological manifestations. So the, the issues with our smell and our taste, while I didn't lose my smell or taste, I had altered smell or taste and continue to have that, although it has decreased in severity and intensity. The headache, the, the dizziness or lightheadedness, double vision, um, I'll just skip down um, the ataxia. Lots of people have that. Um, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, I, um, I had no awareness of, of that as being a symptom um, until I had it. And more people started telling me that, oh, yes, that they were diagnosed with that as well. Um, obviously, a lot of people die from ARDS. Um, but most of us that are long haulers, that's not what we had. We had these other respiratory um, syndromes. And um, so sadly, we, we also now know that um, people are going into Alzheimer's disease early. And um, there's um, this horrible disorder called acute necrotizing encephalopathy. And this slide is, um, um, you'll find the references to the, in the back, but this is from um, um, Angela Wenting, 
in frontiers in, psycho in psychiatry. Okay, so what are the psychological consequences of COVID-19? The main ones that we have um, identified are anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, hallucinations, which is a form of psychosis, a brief um, psychosis typically, and paranoia, which is also another form of psychosis. So I want to share here um, that my personal experience um, of, a of the psychological consequences of COVID-19 include anxiety. I um, became very um, anxious um, about when we came home to Florida, uh, about um, when I'm in the car going to an appointment with my husband, all the cars feel like they're really close to me and that they're moving at apparently a much more <laughs> rapid rate of speed than they are in real life. So my perception and my proprioception are disturbed. Fortunately, I didn't experience depression, but a lot of people do. And um, post-traumatic stress disorder, I don't meet the criteria. As a clinical psychologist, I know what those criteria are, and I happen to be a PTSD expert, but I have some symptoms that are, are seen in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I did um, have the pleasure of experiencing hallucinations. So um, our family um, enjoys um, me developing a relationship with ducks in our community pond right outside of our, our, of our home. And part of my therapy, if you will, was to go out and feed the, the ducks. And then eventually the ducks had ducklings. And I ordered some duckling food uh, off of Amazon and I started feeding the, the, the baby ducklings. And then the geese arrived. And um, so I had all sorts of um, um, birds in my backyard, including a massive stork. But what happened was that those birds were in my bedroom and I awakened in the middle of the night um, and there was a goose and a duck standing next to me between my bed and the window and, um, and it's dark, it's pitch dark. And I am trying to make sense of these animals being in my bedroom. And I start to get out of bed and the goose jumped on my bed. So then I got out with the duck <laughs> and I said, come on, come on, let's go get you some food. And I called the goose over and I opened my bedroom door and then I turned on the light. And right then is when I realized I was having a hallucination. That was um, just before I was hospitalized in October of, of 2020. I have had several friends that have experienced profound paranoia. They think um, people are, are poisoning them um, with COVID. Um, they're poisoning the water, all sorts of um, paranoid notions about obsessive compulsive disorder. So these are the major psychological consequences of having COVID-19, whether it's um, a, whether you had it for two weeks or whether you ha you've had it for 26 months. Um, and people who were intubated um, or in the ICU in any capacity often are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. But any of us can experience any of these things. And it's shocking the percentage of people, um, it's upwards of 30% um, of people, 40% who never had any kind of mental illness whatsoever. Um, and I certainly have never experienced hallucinations. And I, the only anxiety that I had ever felt before was the kind of anxiety when you slam on the brakes because you see a squirrel running across or a deer comes out and you get the normal stress response. So I, I um, hadn't experienced the kind of anxiety that is, um, that is well known with, with COVID. So um, I wanted to share this 
um, slide with you because it talks about the multi-organ systems that are involved. Now, the slide was done by Harry, Cro uh, Harry Crook et al. Um, at the um, British um, Medical Journal. And um, they, they do not list all of the, the possible complications, but it does list many of the typical complications. So I wanted you to have a chance to look at this, but I want you to also um, think about it um, from the perspective as a COVID long hauler. I had the, the heart complications. I've had the brain complications, no spleen issues. I have um, 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 lesions in my liver. I have blood vessel issues. I, um, when I was in the hospital, this second day when I was in the hospital, I couldn't walk. They did um, Doppler studies of my legs. And despite being on Eliquis, a very effective um, blood thinner anticoagulant, I have a blood clot in my left calf. And so that's not supposed to be able to happen. Um, I have every gastrointestinal tract um, symptom you can imagine. I had a paralyzed right vocal fold. I had to have two surgeries so that I could talk again. Um, I have um, kidney lesions, no issues with my pancreas to date. And I had, and I think this was one of the most significant things that came out of me participating in a seven Tesla MRI and PET scan of my, um, my brain, my um, chest and my abdomen is that one year post the initial um, symptoms of COVID, I still had ground glass opacities bilateral pleural effusions and apical and um, 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 basilar lesions a whole year after um, the initial infection. So I want everyone to be aware of these symptoms. And for long haulers, they don't come all at once and they may come and go. And um, obviously this neurological issue that I've been stricken with the Guillain-Barre syndrome just came out of out of the out of blue on on Christmas Day, so I I hope that um, was helpful. Here are the references from my presentation and the the slides that I mentioned: the Crook, Lopez, and Leone, and um, Wenting. Um, they're all listed here as well. Some other references I thought that you might find helpful. Thank you for listening. That was quite quite the journey you've been on and a very helpful, clear overview of the neurological, psychological, and organ uh, damage and complications that occur. That was very helpful. I think I might be requesting your slides <laughs> after this meeting. I'm sure I will get requests for those. Uh, very helpful um, information. And again, thank you for sharing. So we do have some questions from the audience. So let's start with that. Uh, so Dr. Shakuntala uh, has a question. Uh, and feel free to, to come off mute, Lata. And She's wondering, um, so she herself is suffering um, for a long-term uh, COVID symptoms and with hoarseness of her voice. She's wondering, how could she improve that? How did you improve yours? That's a great question. Hopefully I'm off mute. Yes. Shake your head, Katie, if you yeah. can hear me. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I had an absolutely magnificent ENT at Mount Sinai. And um, so I would highly recommend that you be, if you haven't already, and I don't know what your specialty is, um, Dr. Shankatala, um, but I would have an evaluation and, um, and a very thorough evaluation of your esophagus 
and, um, and your throat and your tongue and everything, because this is really a head to toe, tongue to toilet disease. Um, and so I have been participating in um, speech therapy and swallow therapy. And I got this really cool device today. I will show you from my, um, I think I told you that I had come from my, my therapies, but I got this really neat device today. It's called the EMST 150. And you can see it there. And um, I, st I started using it today. I have to do it five times a day, five um, repetitions for five days of the week. And um, having a good speech pathologist on your team that is COVID aware um, is really important because um, we're inflamed. And that's really the issue is massive inflammation. And we have to be really careful with lozenges we put into our mouths. We can't have sugar in a lozenge. Um, and we shouldn't have menthol lozenges or all sorts of things that I learned um, that I didn't know. And, um, and it was, it, it's been incredibly helpful. But I had a setback with the GBS. I was sounded really good. Um, and I've had a little bit of a setback and um, because of, of the, the, G, the GBS impacting um, different nerves. So I would um, also get your, um, your vagus nerve checked out, make, make sure that that's working properly. And um, I, I hope that answers your question. The best ENT you can get and um, really good speech and swallow therapy and practice, do it at home. All right. Thank you so much. That's, that's an interesting device there. Good luck with that. And I, we're glad that you're getting some relief. I, I used it today. <laughs> cool. uh, we have another question from Tatiana. Uh, first off, she says, thank you for talking about your harrowing experience with COVID-19. Have there been any remedies or activities other than the prescribed pharmaceuticals that have brought you relief, even if temporary? Um, well, there are the sort of simple things of, of using ice when you're having myalgia, um, anything you can do to distract yourself. Um, for me, I couldn't even tolerate the, the distractions we would normally do because I, my vision is blurry and I can't tolerate um, like um, too much sound or too much movement. So I couldn't even watch TV or reading. I haven't read a book in 23 months. Um, and I, I, I have to make journal articles huge um, to read. And um, it's, it's, it's challenging and it makes your eyes exhausted as well. So um, putting ice on your, on your eyes, getting some relief, the eye drops for the, the I don't have mine here for a party trick to whip it out of my um, uh, therapy bag, but the, oh, maybe I do. <laughs> um, the specific eye drops to help you um, deal with dryness because I saw the neural ophthalmologist and he said that it's dryness and it's caused by inflammation and we need to constantly be replenishing our drops in our eyes. So that's over the counter. You, you, you can just go to you know, Walgreens or wherever and get that. I think I do have it in the bag if I can pull it out. But I'll listen for another question. Okay, thank you. So we have our next question here from Todd. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Todd wants to know, um, because of your knowledge of long, COVID, because co knowledge in general for long COVID is lacking, did you have any issues convincing your doctors to take your issue seriously? We're <laughs> other. Well, I was pretty shocked that I um, I got to be um, one who experienced, and I think probably most of us have being medically gaslighted. And I, I was shocked that a colleague would do that to me. 
another doctor. And so it was just really shocking. But I have to tell you, I was so sick. I had no access to my normal ability to advocate for myself in the beginning for months, for months and months. And um, boy, I, I, I got that um, spunk back and, and, um, and I have been a champion um, for medical gaslighting. So yes, I was gaslighted here in Jacksonville at the most famous medical clinic because guess what? Even though I was hospitalized there with all the COVID symptoms and I had a blood clot in my brain and was on their neurology floor, um, that night I swabbed negative. And we know those tests are so accurate back in the, in the day. So because I swabbed negative, I had a gastroenterologist who, um, not to my face, but in his clinical note, um, which of course I can read on the patient portal, his number one um, statement was that I was um, suffering with anxiety um, due to long COVID. And I think I was the only expert in the room <laughs> that was a mental health expert. He never even had the respect and he knew that I'm a clinical psychologist. He never had the respect to say, to ask me any questions about my mental health. And, and I would have said, you know, I'm scared. You know, I'm, I'm struggling here. Um, I have all these issues and it's, it's, it's scary. But at that point, I wasn't suffering with anxiety. That just came later. So yes, I have been gaslighted by um, one doctor at Mount Sinai and I immediately contacted the head of the program because I'm like, I'm not gonna put up with it here. And that doctor was um, removed from the COVID center um, because that was nothing that he said to me was appropriate. And um, he was not saying what he was supposed to be saying. And the doctor apologized and said he was filling in for someone else. He wasn't supposed to be seeing COVID patients and he apologized profusely to me. And uh, so that's the only one there. But here in Florida, I was gaslit right and left. And when you're sick, it's, it's, it's essentially impossible for you to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry to whomever asked that question that you're, you're being or have been medically gaslighted. I would really encourage you to have emotional support for that and have somebody else that maybe can be an advocate for you and go to your appointments. Because once I got to Mount Sinai, my husband went to every single appointment with me, except that I was doing neuropsychological testing when I had the issue on the street and he was going to meet me because it was a four hour test that went six hours. So, so it's uh, gaslighting is everywhere. Still today, this far into it. Yeah. Well, thank you. So we have another question here from Geraldine Hamilton, a uh, bit of a more technical question. Um, are you aware of any blood biomarkers or specific types of imaging being applied for diagnostic purposes of some of the major long, long-term effects? Um, I am because I participated in studies, um, but they're not they're not um, um, approved for for general treatment yet. Um, but I have participated in studies at Mount Sinai as well as outside of Mount Sinai um, using I I have had my blood drawn very regularly. Um, even when I was in the hospital with the Guillain Barre, it was time for me to send in a blood um, sample. And um, they, we did that um, and sent it in. So um, there are there are biomarkers. Um, there are papers that um, are about to come out that actually reveal the biomarkers from the studies that I've participated in um, since um, now July. Um, this um, yeah, the la last July was when I when I started in the in the study. So, um, so I know that they're there and, um, and it's not appropriate for me 
to share that information. It is really appropriate for the authors to share that information. Um, but yes, I know that there are biomarkers available and I know that there are um, in the blood. And, and I tell you, I, I really wanted to go over and whack that um, doc in the head with my lab results that showed uh, spike one S1 proteins in my um, non-classical monocytes. So um, even though I swabbed negative, I, wow, somehow have fragments in my non-classical monocytes. Hmm. All right. And others too. That's the, and I know that paper's already been published and I don't have it handy, but if that person asks back channel, I can share that the paper that talks about that um, with them, or I can share it with you and, and you can pin it or whatever fancy thing you do, Katie. <laughs> sure. I'm sure folks would really appreciate that. Yes, as a reminder, if you didn't see in the chat, if you would like uh, the material uh, emailed to you, please do drop your email into the chat. Thank you. Uh, Todd uh, wanted to respond back and said, um, women are gaslit in healthcare. Those with chronic fatigue syndrome experience this. And it doesn't surprise me that it continues with long COVID. Thank you, Todd, for that. that I, I, just got, I just got gaslighted two weeks ago and um, I, it was the, the rheumatologist that saw me in the hospital. Um, he, he told me um, that I had um, um, fibromyalgia. And I said, really? Um, and, and what is that based on? He said, well, you have all of these um, pain, you know, I have pain in your muscles, you have pain when I touch you. you know, uh, he said, I can smell it a mile away. And I said, um, well, in terms of the COVID community, um, they, we don't diagnose in the COVID community with fibromyalgia, we, we call it myalgia, but it's not the same thing. And he said, it's the same thing. And um, so I just needed him to do um, a couple tests for me. So I got those done and I have a follow-up appointment, which I will not be keeping. Um, but I'm going to call him and let him know that um, I'm going to I'm going to send him some studies that show that it's inappropriate to diagnose a COVID long hauler who has um, nerve um, in injury and all of these other issues that cause pain <laughs> um, to to diagnose me. It's a it's a diagnosis of exclusion, as all the doctors on here are aware. And it was just the, uh, a way of gaslighting me. Mm. I think most of nod your heads if you agree and um, <laughs> watch all the heads go. <laughs> so yeah, I couldn't believe it. Um, my cousin was with me and she got to hear it and she was flabbergasted. So, yeah. Still, still today to me. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Michelle uh, from Make Good Together. Uh, because of the hypercoagulation issues, have you been taking anticoagulants regularly or only during short term after the blood clot events you've experienced? No, the, um, the, the guidance is to not stop the, the coagulation, anti -co sorry, anticoagulation. <laughs> Um, because in long haulers, we have this, this um, well, it's a long haul, and I like to call it the Corona Coaster. And um, we are, and it's like the Incredible Hulk um, combined with uh, Spider-Man or something. And it's just crazy, the things that are happening to our bodies. No one could have, I have never missed a dose, not a single dose of my Eloquist, except when I was bridging um, to have a surgery. And then I, I injected Luvinox. So I've never missed any doses, then immediately resumed the Eliquis. So to get a blood clot while on it is very interesting. So I am going to be seeing a specialist, um, a hematologist um, um, that specializes in blood clotting disorders to, to see if they can understand. Because my left leg um, is swells and is discolored 
Um, and it's gotten worse as I've been going to physical therapy outpatient, it's gotten worse and worse. So we got to get to the bottom of that and understand what's going on with, with that. And if I have some other blood clots that have formed now. So no, um, I never stopped a single day. Now I'm on Xarelto and, um, and I may end up on one of the old ones. Um, um, and that won't be fun, but well, obviously I don't want to have a stroke. Um, and I am having a surgery um, to close the PFO in my heart um, to, because I have the blood clot, they're gonna, I'm gonna have to, uh, a, a surgery to, to do that. Mm. Upcoming, yeah. <laughs> because we need another thing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one uh, final question and then a couple of comments. Uh, we're at the hour, so we'll be wrapping up shortly. Uh, so finally, from Victoria Wong, she's actually participating um, in uh, helping with the study with uh, NIH recovery. Uh, they're recruiting participants with long COVID. Do you have any suggestions for where uh, folks that are, um, I believe, Victoria, you're asking for folks that have had long COVID for over two years or around two years um, that can be recruited? Um, if that's not accurate, you can come off uh, mute and clarify. Oh, the thought. Okay, they, they I like. Know. Oh. Victoria, are you there? Okay. Okay. We'll follow them for two years. Okay, so looking for long haulers that are willing to be followed for two years. Okay. Well. Um, we have Facebook groups. I think Survivor Corps is um, a, a great place to, to search. Um, I also think uh, posting um, about it on our um, Mass Together America platform would be another place. But there are many, um, the body politic, um, there are many different um, really large um, Facebook groups. Um, that, that would be able to provide people that actually meet whatever the criteria is that they're looking for. How far into a long hauler do they have to be? And you know, I, I know they have exclusion criteria, so it's just a matter of what that is. Um, but it, um, even in our closed groups, if, um, if you send something to me that you want to post on our closed group, I can get that posted um, on our, our closed groups. Um, so we, we can definitely help spread the word of, of the, um, that they're recruiting in, in the recovery um, study. And that's a, a, a huge, huge, huge study covering a bunch of different things. So it's, it's amazing. Well, thank you. You've got a lot of accolades here in the chat uh, for your spunk, your bravery, um, you're sharing and everyone, we've got a lot of requests for those excellent slides, Robbie. And uh, we can't thank you enough for your time coming out here and, and speaking with us. It's wonderful to be to know you more and to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so great to, to finally have some time to chat with you. So we'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Bye.